Hi, everyone. Uh, we are here with John the Duncan because there are many things bothering him and me, and he's very kindly decided to join us here. So, um, Mr. John the Duncan, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and where you are? Um, emotionally or physically? Um... Yes. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm John. Uh uh, John Duncan, JD, JTD, the various acronyms that, that I might go by. Emotionally, I'm uh, a bottle and a half deep of wine. Uh, physically, I'm in London. Uh, oh, okay. And those two things tend to be correlated. Uh, uh, we live on the, 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 the trash island uh, where, yeah. where the bad people are. And we Which... try to make the best of that situation. Well, uh, yeah, and I guess that's that's part of what we're, we're going to talk about today is... Um what it's like being in Western countries that aren't America and dealing with, um, but are Western countries that aren't America. Yeah, I know. So, shocker. Right. Um, but the problem with being sucks. a Western country and dealing with, um, kind of, uh, uh, one of the first things I want to ask you is here in Canada, there's definitely this kind of aspect of things where we feel like, Oh, well, at least we're not the United States and me and other progressives mm -hmm. are sitting here like, that's a low fucking bar to clear. Like, really? <laughs> Is it kind of similar in Britain as well of, look, I know people say that we have some problems, but we're better than, you know, the rest of Europe or we're better than America. Like, is that a thing for you guys too? The, the closest comparison there is the way that Scotland looks at England. Right, um, okay. So Scotland, Scotland has a self-image of being more progressive, more fucking uh, socialist, maybe not the right word, but more progressive than, than England. Um, less racist, less colonial. It's bullshit. Um, but it's like a similar sort of it, like a similar sort of thing uh, as the uh, the Canada, the US kind of difference, where Scottish folk will be like, "Well, at least we're not England. Uh, we may be an awful neoliberal shithole, but we're not racist like England." Um, and then you talk to like any racialized person who lives in scotland uh and you realize that's horseshit because uh, we're just as racist we're just as shit we're just as bad as england is um uh, we just have this this veneer of of independence and of sort of veneer of progressiveness that 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 we can lean on to make ourselves look better than england okay um, so so then from a canadian perspective scotland is like the uk's quebec in that instance I don't know enough about Canada to know if that's true. Okay, well, for the Canadians um, in the audience, they're probably <laughs> howling with laughter and thinking, oh my God, maybe he's right. So yeah, that's going to be fun. But I, I, have a video, I did a video on um, Scottish imperialism. Yes, I did. And, I saw that. Uh, a lot of the way that Scotland deals with imperialism uh, and its sort of progressiveness, a, lo a lot of the comments are from Canadians talking about how they recognize that and the, like Canada's relationship to the U.S., um which is interesting <laughs> well it's it's also like a lot of people unfortunately here in canada view a lot of things through the lens of america which i understand because they're basically our only neighbor of significance like no offense to greenland but they don't really count um and so you know when when that's kind of your only neighboring country that's kind of what you tend to compare people to right like mm -hmm. how are we doing compared to our one other neighbor on the street right which unfortunately is a really low bar to clear and another thing that often goes unremarked upon in canada uh which is something i do try and fight back on in like my own videos touching on canadian history and stuff is how we did a lot of imperialism on behalf of the british empire and as willing participants within it uh, like, you know, we, we were there in the Boer War in South Africa where war crimes were committed. That was our first real international war. It's a, you know, somewhat glorified footnote in our history mm. textbooks, right? It's like, oh yeah, the first time Canadians went overseas with South Africa, kids. <laughs> it's like, hey, what happened in South Africa? We don't talk about that part. So, yeah, it, yeah it's, it's kind of a problem. Thing. And at the end of the day, right? Like, I don't know. I'm pretty sure we're, you guys are not taught anything about Canada really over there, but 
At the end of the day, the unification of the various different British colonies of what was then known as British North America was fundamentally a project to protect British imperialism and interests in the North American continent. That's mm. it. Like, it, it, sure, there were other little aspects to it about integration and economy and a shared sense of, like, pride in being British subjects because we weren't fully Canadian at this point. We were still, like, British subjects first and foremost, you know, for king and mm. country and all that horse shit. Um, and so that is often I left out. I love the little hand movement you did there. That was a lovely... It was a lovely little thing you did there. Uh, it's, it's, it's the it's the British officer salute, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You learn some of that <laughs> stuff too. Um, but yeah, just just all that kind of stuff just really sits in this weird cesspool of no. See, that's totally fine because so long as we're not America and doing the terrible things that America is doing, that's mm. fine. And it's like we're still fighting indigenous people and taking them to you know court and there are basically indigenous genocide deniers here in canada saying oh well no you can't possibly be a genocide sure some people died but a genocide come on now it's like mm. why why do we have to live in the shitty timeline where america is the lowest fuck bar for you know moral questionability and so therefore anything canada does or britain does basically gets a pass you feel me like it's just yeah. really frustrating so how do you try and fight back against that over there on on the glorious island of britannia i guess like I'll, I'll go first first let's do a wee a wee sort of comparative history of scotland's relationship with imperialism as well because i think that's useful uh to, to compare with canada because one of the main things one of the main defenses that you get from from Scottish folk about imperialism is uh, it wasn't really Scotland. Scotland might have been part of it, but they were forced into it. They didn't really benefit from it. Right, because of the, the collapse of the Durian scheme or whatever, right? Like, right. they invested, like, what was it, like a quarter of Scotland's GDP into this one single colony project in what's now known as Panama, but to Scotland it was known as the Durian colony. Yeah. Okay, all right. um, and then and then went into that was one of the major reasons why Scotland decided to go into the, um, uh, go into like basically what would become the United Kingdom, um, I, I you know it was Scottish bourgeois interests deciding that the best thing was to save their capital, uh, in the emerging in the emerging world and form a United Kingdom, and then there was you know uh, parts like. The union of the crowns had happened years before, so Scotland and England had a had the same king. Um, James the First of England was James the Sixth of Scotland, and so on and so forth. So there was integration there. Um, but what one of the things that uh, is interesting to me is Scottish people will say things like the, the they will point to Glasgow. Glasgow didn't have much slave imports or slave dealings. Uh, and they'll say, well, Glasgow wasn't built on colonialism or slavery. Um, but what Glasgow was built on was sugar and the sugar mm. plantations coming in from the the West Indies, obviously inherently part of colonialism and slavery. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and um, also Scottish education was a big part of colonialism and doctors and administrators were huge parts of the colonial empire. Uh, and, and like in fact, the um, middle management, doctors, administrators, um, middle managers of uh, the colonies were vastly overrepresented by Scottish people. That's why you get a lot of folk in the West Indies who have the second name Duncan or other Scottish names uh, because Scottish people did bad things there. Um, but Scottish people you, you, you refuse to engage with it. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm I'm not too far from um, a, a county in Ontario called I think it's like the United Counties of Glengarry, Stormont, and Dundas, and mm. in there they are home to the largest Highland Games outside of Scotland. So yeah, Scots right. got around. Yeah. So there were, there was a um, and I think 2011. Uh, early early 2010s, the SNP, who were the government, well, they still are the government, um, they put together a 
uh, Bring Scots Home campaign. I remember they... this. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they, they sent around flyers saying, like, to, they sent them to Canada, to New Zealand, to Australia, basically. Yeah. I think maybe the US as well, and said, uh, Bring Scots Home. Um, we, we've we've got lots of ancestors, lots lots of people there, and we can bring them home. And there was a little bit of an outcry because there were no non-white people in this sort of campaign. And eventually the SNP caved and added one Asian man into the campaign. <laughs> and we're like, oh, we've, so- we- we've solved uh, historic oh racism God. by photoshopping an Asian man <laughs> to, oh. to truly deal with Scottish imperialism. And the way that it's fully uh, enmeshed with with uh, British imperialism. But one one of the sort of interesting things I think about imperialism and Scottish, Scotland's relationship to it is how tightly it's bound up with Scottish identity. Like the ideas of tartan, of like Scotland as like warriors, um, is all bound up with like myths created by Walter Scott in the. 18th or 19th century, can't remember which, um, where he basically created this mythology of Scotland, of the tartan-wearing clans, uh, and, oh. and this whole national mythology is all just built around imperialism. Y- you will actually love this then, um, as, as like an interesting tie into that. Uh, there are provincial and territorial tartans in Canada, as well as the national tartan, Meaning that uh, if I'm ever invited to a Scottish wedding and it's like, oh yeah, you gotta wear a kilt, there is actually technically, um, I I could either choose to wear the Ontario tartan because I'm from Ontario, or I could wear the Canadian tartan, which is just yeah. like, I mean, that's kind of neat, but at the same time, is this really necessary? And like that kind of just adds into your point of um, Scottish imperialism, where again, like our first prime minister, Sir John A. Macdonald was a violent drunk and a vicious racist. Mm -hmm. And he was above all, first and foremost, a proud Scot and a servant of the crown. Yeah. I mean, like, it's interesting with, with, with questions of like Scottish independence. Um, what's interesting is that it's, um, increasing salience has come about, uh, uh, along with the decline of British imperialism and of the decline of statewide British institutions, things like statewide unions, um, statewide like uh, transport unions as well. Um, and it's an interesting kind of dichotomy between the image that Scottish independence tries to paint for itself, which tends to be very like Nordic model progressive, which has its own problems within its own framing. Uh, but even then, is negated by the the history of the emergence of Scottish independence as a movement, and the de- the, the 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 decline of uh, unionism of, of unionism in the sense of like um, like being a part British of a labor Scot- union and going on strike, labor, yeah, yeah. negotiating contracts every three years. I get you, yeah, yeah, um, and uh, the, the the start of neoliberalism, uh, and it's it's an interesting kind of dichotomy which the scottish left tends not to want to deal with um so my, my general opinion on independence is i don't necessarily give a shit i don't think it matters that much okay so, uh, so you're not for are, or against scottish independence I, like my 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 main opinion is that it would be funny uh, <laughs> <'cause>... <laughs> well let's be independent for a laugh fuck it <laughs> I like it would annoy people, which, you know, the worst people, which is funny. Um, but I also know that, like, the Scottish left has no idea what it's doing. And it's it's not willing to deal with the, the fact that we are, in most ways, essentially the same as England. We're just as racist. We're just as fucked. We have shit union movements. We have, you know... Um, lack of ability to deal with their imperialism just in a slightly different way um i don't think the scottish left is prepared for what independence means uh which is an opinion which has uh supported any time i talk to any racialized scottish person um you know for i i used to i used to date uh um uh, a girl who was originally from sri lanka but grew up in scotland for most of her life 
I remember sitting in Glasgow Green and having racist abuse hurled at us. It's just like, it's, like it's, it's, it's just as common in Scotland as it is anywhere else. Uh, but the Scottish left still likes to think of itself in, in glowing terms, um, which is bad. <laughs> No, I, I, I agree it's absolutely mad, but I think, again, that comes, unfortunately, in relation to the Scottish perception of itself as, like, a victim of England and English interests as opposed to a willing participant in mm. imperialism from the British Isles, right? Like, that's, yeah. it's it's a similar thing with, you know, and I know I'm an Anglo and I might get, you know, some hate from Quebecers for this, but it's a similar thing with... um. Quebec viewing itself as a victim of like British wars and imperialism and then being, you know, trapped within Canada. Um, and that's why their nationalist aspirations always come from that place of fear and trying to preserve what little they have left, considering the borders historically of New France and Quebec have been chipped away at or thrown into dispute for various reasons. And, you know, oh, look, we're just surrounded by hundreds of millions of Anglophones, and there's just us, a couple million French speakers here in North America carrying on a century's proud legacy and tradition and unique culture. Come on, this is why we need to preserve mm -hmm. it, and that's why we need independence. You know, we, we didn't willingly go along with this stuff. We, you know, we were just poor victims caught in the crossfire of imperialism. When if you yeah. actually delve into it and um, Quebec's practices, especially in terms of mining and asbestos, holy crap, they are villains in that regard. Let's make no bones about it. Yeah. But, you know, on the at the same time, Quebec has arguably been the greatest center of progressivism and progressive policies in Canada outside of the prairies when the farmers were socialist for a while back in like the 50s and the 60s. It's this big complicated picture which I wish more Canadians actually appreciated both in terms of like yeah Quebec is complicated by all means tear them down for a lot of the terrible stuff they say and do but also let's appreciate a lot of the good they have done for not only themselves but for Canada. It's it's more than just like a province full of French speakers and separatists and so the diminishing of that uh, really upsets me, which maybe you'll appreciate this actually as just like a completely random note. Um, a very overlooked yet very important part of Canadian history are the rebellions of 1837. And the most successful of these, which was still ultimately a failure, but the one that actually went on the longest and proved an actual threat was the uh, rebellion in Lower Canada, which is what we used to call Quebec. Basically, these rebellions popped up and were mainly started by a bunch of like guys in progressives if you want to call them that uh, or like old school liberals in Quebec who um, wanted to have reforms and democracy in what would become Canada and also just their little colony mm -hmm. and so by fighting against this they were fighting against the uh, what were known as the family compact and the chateau clique and these were two groups in both like what would become Ontario and Quebec respectively that were basically a nascent aristocracy that were trying to become a fully fledged aristocracy. And they were also openly anti-democratic and extremely corrupt, like basically controlling legislatures. It was really messed up. And so that's why the Patriot of Quebec, led by a guy who is often vilified in Canadian history, but very much celebrated in Quebec history and Quite frankly, Quebec has a right to celebrate him. His name was Louis-Joseph Papineau. And that man, as far as I'm concerned, should be considered like a father of the nation. Because he had like this whole list of demands of like, we want actual meaningful progressive reforms and democracy mm -hmm. and a government that is accountable to the people and is elected by the people. Whole bunch of really good stuff. And uh, when these like nascent aristocracies were not budging on this and basically trying to criminalize the activities of him and other political activists. This is what turned them to the actual rebellion in 1837. And theirs was more successful than the one in Ontario. It had to be put down and it resulted in like the Durham report where some dude named Lord Durham came over and said like, okay, yeah, what's with like British colonies and always wanting to rebel. We had this 50 years ago with America. What's going on? And uh, that was sort of crucial to getting the ball rolling on what would become Canada. But what a lot of people don't realize is that that rebellion was fundamentally a push against the emerging of a British style aristocracy in Canada. That's why there is no aristocracy in Canada outside of like early prime ministers being knighted over in England. Cause like, Oh, thanks for being a loyal subject. The reason why there isn't like 
a Duke and Duchess of Edmonton and shit like that is precisely because of these rebellions, particularly the one in Quebec. And I don't think enough people recognize or appreciate that the reason we aren't as messed up and have a House of Lords and shit like that is because of Quebec patriots fighting for what they believe in. So how much like, were they? Um, how much were like the Quebec? Those those folks related. Like, how much work do they do with indigenous folk in those areas? Oh, no, that's the thing. Indigenous people are completely, like, out of the picture Quebec for Quebecers, right? Um, right. Things have gone a bit better, but again, it's like, it, Quebec is, again, part of the settler colonial state. Um, they just see themselves as also, like, sidelined victims of a different kind within that. Um, hmm. Something that's often spoken about, especially in the wake of the emergent Quebec nationalism in the 1960s and 1970s, was the idea of the two solitudes, which is that of English Canada and French Canada. Because, look, we're just so incredibly different. But uh, hmm. ask Indigenous people, and the real two solitudes are between, like, Canada, which includes Quebec, whether you view it as a nation, aspirational nation, etc., and that conflict with the settler colonial state against indigenous people. Uh, yeah. Again, there have been improvements. Uh, Quebec often relies on a lot of indigenous land for their economic activities, such as mining, lumber and forestry, and of course, hydroelectric power. A lot of the hydroelectric power is generated in the north of Quebec, which is very heavily like Cree and Inuit land up there. So there's very much like an issue of that that goes unremarked upon because unfortunately to the rest of mainstream English Canada, Quebec is just, oh, it's all the French people who say tabarnak and they love their poutine and their name Jean-Francois Calais. And I'm like, okay, so that right there is a stereotype we have about very real people in our country and not a fundamental appreciation for where they mm. come from and what they've done for the country that is both good and and bad. And so I bring this up because I feel like probably on some level, you can understand this as a Scotsman in the UK and also the problems with the left of, you know, yeah, look, see, we're so much better. But if you also take a step back, you realize, wait, no, there's actually a ton of problems and racism going on here, right? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't think Scotland has been a bastion of radicalism in that in a way that like you may be sort of implying there and I, I don't like it's been there's an image scotland has that has been uniquely maligned by the, the british state um and compared with the rest of the uk which isn't i think true different parts of of england north of england even midlands like places like birmingham have been subject to huge uh decline managed decline by the english state for a long time in a way that much of Scotland hasn't. Edinburgh and Glasgow are huge areas of profit for, for Britain as a whole and have been huge areas of investment in many ways. Well, for also, no offence, but aren't those basically the only like two major cities in Scotland? I mean, yeah, they, they, they are. So, I mean, if you wanted... Uh, Aberdeen uh, had the oil. Um, okay. Aberdeen and the Shetland Islands had, had oil reserves, which gave them particular benefits uh which which edinburgh and glasgow didn't have and but also which like liverpool manchester newcastle eh, bolton fucking all those other northern cities didn't have either scotland as a bastion of radicalism isn't really true i don't think okay. there, there's there's an image because scotland scotland rejected the poll tax um margaret thatcher's poll tax and because of basically because of Thatcher and well, the way that she treated Scotland, like, Scotland okay, has created maybe you should an have, image. Of... Like because again, I don't know how many of my people are Scottish or British. Mm. Like what was the poll tax? So the the poll tax, um, it was essentially a tax that stopped. Fuck, I can't remember exactly what what the poll tax did. It essentially stopped people um, from engaging in voting. Essentially, the the problem with the poll tax was that. Uh, it was unfair to working people and it had huge rejection in Scotland uh, and because of that uh, Scotland created an image of itself of being uniquely anti-Tory um, and okay. uniquely anti-English um, but up until uh, up until Margaret Thatcher and up until the poll tax Scotland 
didn't have a problem with conservatism. Uh, <laughs> Margaret Thatcher uh, herself was what created the antipathy to uh, to conservatism in Scotland. Um, so it's not it's not very old in antipathy to, to conservatism in Scotland. It's like forty years old. Uh, but I that mean, antipathy, that's older than me, so yeah, it's kind of old. But but the antipathy isn't necessarily against conservatism as a concept, more just the Conservative Party. Right, so conservatism yeah, okay. still exists, um, and social attitude surveys reveal that consistently. Um, my my undergraduate research was analysis of British and Scottish election study data, and those are two massive studies of um, basically voting behaviour. Uh, I think the, the British election survey is like of 10,000 people, Scottish election surveys of like 3,000. Um, and for anyone who knows like statistical modelling, basically the limit of, of a um, reliable data set is 1,000. That's like, you know you're getting reliable data if you've got 1,000 people. Yeah, so yeah. these are big data sets that are producing reliable data. And what they consistently show is that conservative uh, uh, Scottish and English uh, social attitudes are the same. There's a hair's breadth between them. They're not more progressive one way or the other. Um, but the Scottish people have been tricked into thinking that we're more progressive because we don't like the Conservative Party because of this cultural antipathy uh, to Thatcherism, because of the poll tax and because of, you know, closure of mines. And I grew up in a former mining town which was incredibly deprived because of the lack of mining. Right. But that was that was true throughout Northern England as well. Uh, but it was the, the the poll tax which really produced this anti-Tory uh, angle in Scotland. Um, it's just it's just a lie essentially. It's, it's like built on this 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 lie that we're more progressive um, than anyone else in, I, in the I, UK. I, I gotcha. Um, but you mentioned like your understudy, and aren't you also like a teaching assistant, like an assistant professor? I mean, um, professor means different things in the UK. Okay. Uh, um, I, I do teaching for the university. Um, I've just started doing teaching for the university. Um, I mean, that's pretty impressive. You're teaching other young kids about like life, the universe, and everything. That's pretty <laughs> impressive as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I mean, mainly about neoliberalism. <laughs> well, look, that's life, the universe, and everything as far as capitalists sure. are concerned, right? So, you know, that's kind of right. Um, wh what do you find is, like, the most surprising thing about your students, either in terms of, like, something that they're ignorant about, or, like, they surprise you in a really good, positive way? Well, I mean... So, so the class I'm the class I'm teaching right now is a master's class, and there aren't that many of them. It's like six people. Um, oh wow! Okay. Because uh, it's it's just a small master's class. Um, I guess like I I don't know if it's surprising. What's what's good about them is that they are curious about the world. Um, That's a good start. When when you're when you're teaching, there's a tendency to view yourself as the expert the one who's got the knowledge to disperse to people um, but no matter like who the person is uh, they'll have something interesting to say even if they've even if they're, like not done the reading they can ask a question which spurs on a discussion in an interesting way um, so what, what's been best for me is I prefer like the discussions, the facilitating discussions with with students rather than the lectures. Lectures are fine, um, but if you're facilitating a discussion, you can get people to think about what's being said uh, and what that means and what it means to them. Um, and you get a lot of people who. So, for example, my last one, I was talking about the way that neoliberalism affects welfare and how welfareism is viewed as a means through which the ideal neoliberal subject is created through work programs, uh, forcing people into seeking work 35 hours a week, turning welfare recipients into basically a job. And uh, one of the students 
uh, had an interesting point about how she, for years, thought of welfare as a shameful thing, something that you shouldn't be claiming because it's a failure. And that is exactly the point that I was making, uh, but in a much more personal sense. She realised that, like, the system was making her feel ashamed of the idea of welfare. Um, and that was extremely neoliberal. And I didn't have to tell her that, but it was something that she came to on her own, which is an interesting and valuable insight for everyone else in that class. Look at look at you doing what conservatives say. You're brainwashing all these youngins and <laughs> turning them into radicals. Uh, by the way, I do you... Even... Do you... Do you wear that uh, that hilarious uh, sweatshirt <laughs> to your lectures, or is that strictly I, I, banned? <laughs> I almost did. I very almost did. Nice. Uh, why, why don't you have to show it to the camera more appropriately for people who can't fully see it? See, there we go. <laughs> oh, I simultaneously I love that and I hate it. Those. Like, oh man. Oh yeah, me too. It's awful. <laughs> cheers to that which actually um that's a that's a question i got for you um i don't know if it'll make it into the cut or not because we were just kind of moving while setting the stream of making sure things were were going good and recording you know we, we were talking a bit about uh booze you said you're like a bottle of wine deep i'm into my lovely double oaked bourbon because i am a little mm. bit of a southern boy at heart uh, what, what wine are you drinking right now? What's, what's, what's good in London? Um, well, right now, um, but I, I've, so I landed on my feet in, in the flat I've moved into. Okay. Um, so my flatmate buys these like boxes of wine and he puts them on the wine rack. I, I was previously drinking this white wine that was on deal in the co-op. Um, but I got this, this wine from the wine rack, uh, Arabella. Reserve. Wait, you guys have is... wine rack there too? Oh fuck, man! I'm out of my league in terms of like bouginess here. Um, oh, there's man. a wine rack. I don't rack. know how I feel about wine rack existing in Britain. Oy. All right. The the closest thing I had to before last time I was like working a job. We had a drinks trolley, <laughs> which is not quite a wine rack. <laughs> no, I I, I used percent. to live in Spain, and that was uh, just like aisles of wine from the region and around the country just mwah, wonderful I, i'm just aware that my my teeth and lips are going to get increasingly red throughout this throughout this interview <laughs> that's that's cool man like this is again this is just supposed to be kind of chill vibes talking about whatever this is about humanizing people and also talking about like leftist and uh progressive things um so i guess like the follow-up question for me while we're still sort of on the subject of booze um is wine your go-to drink or are you like a true Scot and you're like, no, I got to have my scotch every so often. Like what? I, I do like whiskey. Um, okay. Uh, wine, wine is a good drink. I've been, I've been on a white wine kick recently cause I found it doesn't give me as bad hangovers. Oh, there you um, go. <laughs> yeah. Um, beer. I, I like a beer, but beer gets you up for oh, fucking hell. I've become a dad. <laughs> beer gets you up for pissing too much. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they ain't that the truth. I, I do like a whiskey. I like a smoky whiskey. Okay. Uh, like yeah. a Talisker or, um, yeah, yeah, a, a, a nice smoky whiskey is something that I will go for any day of the week. Um, I can't afford it anymore. When I was living with my parents over the pandemic uh, and didn't have any expenses, I could afford to buy a nice whiskey every now and again. I, not, not, I hear you on yeah. that. Uh, the, in fact, what I'm drinking now is like a leftover um, Christmas gift from last year. I've slowly gone through the bottle over the year, like rationing it out. Yeah. <laughs> Guess what's on the wish list <laughs> this year? <laughs> my my, um, my dad, uh, my mom told my dad not to buy me any whiskey for my birthday. Um, what? Oh, come on. She, then. she said I had too much whiskey. I had no whiskey. Um, so what he did instead was buy me a bottle of brandy. <laughs> <laughs> it was really nice. I'd never had like nice brandy before. It was like uh, genuinely fucking delicious. Um, Brandy's good. A, a nice smoky whiskey instead. No, if anyone's in London and wants to buy me a smoky whiskey. <laughs> 
Put it, put it, put it on your wish list and like tell your patrons to buy it for you. Or something. Uh, you know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, um, so you're originally from Scotland, but you're living and working in London, which is like arguably one of the most important financial centers in the world. How does it feel kind of living in one of the deepest, darkest nests of neoliberalism? Um, things, the, the nest of neoliberalism, you don't necessarily feel so, so much. So I, I live in a block, which is essentially built for, uh, finance people. Um, okay. I was going to say, like, like, if you were about to say I live in Reading, I'm like, why uh, does everyone I know from London live in Reading? <laughs> but okay. All right. I, I had an ex-girlfriend when I was first in here who lived in, in Reading. <laughs> oh fuck it! It was a hassle to get to. Yeah, no, it's um, far. But anyway, that's beside the point. Yes, please continue. So you're in this like financial kind of area, yeah? Like financial district, and it's like it's a lovely flat. I've got the hue lighting. Got a kitten. Huge balcony. The cat um, is so cute, by the way. Oh my god! Post he, more pictures, he's a, please. He's a fucking. He's a fucking dream. He's a. He's a demon. But he's a dream. Um. But the dream demon. Is... He's your he's your sleep paralysis demon. There you go. He fucking is. Um, <laughs> but the, the area is incredibly dead. Um, I was talking to someone uh, uh, talking about this with someone earlier today. I don't think you necessarily see the the hub of neoliberalism in the sense like because it's a financial district. You necessarily see. All, all the horrors of neoliberalism out in front of you, but what you see is like this flat is is like a box where people go to work and they come back from work and nothing else exists. So it's like lots of little boxes, which if you saw um, uh, Sam, we're in hell's latest video, or maybe not latest, last but one video, on neoliberal space in the neoliberal city, this sort of discussion of boxes. Um, that's that's where... on my it's on my watch list. Unfortunately, because I've since doing this, I've met so many amazing people who just also put out videos all around the same time. It's like my watch list just is at like permanently fifty, and every time I knock a few off, there's a few more that I have to add, and it's like. Man, be honest, I'm I've, so behind. I need a break to like catch I've, up. I've not seen this video either, but I sent him some articles for it which speak to similar things, so I'm trusting he's trusted me uh, about it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, lo lots of the space here is like... Neoliberal space is an interesting thing. Um, because it, it, part of neoliberalism is about creating particular subjectivities. Um, the, the worker, whatever. Um, and these houses are built for the worker. They're built for the financial worker in particular, where you you stay in your box. There's no shops. There's no community. Um, you you order your food, and and you go to your work. And it's an interesting, if depressing, idea of how space and how community should exist. As like a Things bare like, bones essential piece of utilitarian function. Yeah, and it's a bit like the suburb. The suburb, uh, in my view, is a, a very neoliberal construction. Okay, I I agree with that in terms of okay, you you go out here. This is where you live. This is where you buy and consume and look. The white picket fence and the wife and the children and the dog consume, consume. You have the nice yeah. big TV. It's a nice safe community. Stay home for a few hours with your family. Go to sleep. Wake up. Drop the kids at school. Go to work. Come back. Pick the kids up from school. Go home. Rinse, repeat, yeah. ad nauseum. Take a little bit of a vacation here and there on one or two holidays of, and however you choose to celebrate it that's fine that's freedom right um and like see you know, isn't this so wonderful your work crucially your work is not in the community so you're not going to the local shop and doing your job you're not like going to the local pub and doing your job you're not going to a local school and doing your job you're going to you're in a community town you're going to the local city whether that is uh edinburgh 
Glasgow, London, the the work you do is outside the community in which you live, and in that sense, you're very atomized. Um, it's an extremely neoliberal way of of looking at how work should function. Yeah, kind of like a weird glorified assembly line of uh, existence in a weird way, if that makes any mm. sense. Um, cause one of the things like to sort of counteract that one of the things that I found over my job now as a courier and like just delivering out to other parts of the country, um, I still have like some issues with like small towns and not really having enough. Like I'm still a city boy at heart. Basically. I like, you know, I, I like going to house shows, um, not necessarily clubs, but like going to venues and catch like big live music acts. I like going out to local shops for shopping or for um, like buying great food prepared by many of the different people that have come to form the community. But you also see very real elements still of community where, you know, I stop at enough places cause, Oh yeah, I'm here to, you know, whatever, just like get a coffee or I'm here to get lunch or it's a regular customer. And so you start to get mm. to know people in these small little communities and they say, Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, you delivered up there. That's like my parents place, or my grandparents place. They're super appreciative of everything. Like you left exactly where they asked you to and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, like there's some real like country getting to know people and everyone knows this stuff. That's totally ignoring the issues of like, poverty and runaway skyrocketing prices thanks to remote work and people f with money from like other larger cities just moving out to rural communities and just utterly ruining them in a variety of ways but there is still like that kind of sense of community which you touch on and how that's very much lacking in certain city spaces and it's definitely true um that uh there are areas of cities that are just completely dead at night and there's really nothing to do, whether they're suburbs or like certain condo towers or like, um, we don't really have a term for them here, but it's basically just like usually two or three high rise apartment buildings thrown up mm. somewhere by like a bus stop or like a subway stop. And like, but there's nothing there. It's just, yeah, here's where literally thousands of people live, but there's nothing for miles. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, it's what, one of the, one of the interesting things about, one of the interesting things about the pandemic actually was that it showed the limits of neoliberalism in terms of its own project. So what we got a lot of was people coming together as communities establishing mutual aid networks supporting friends and family and um, i was so happy for a while there please don't remind me more about that <laughs> well what what it, it was it revealed to us that despite the 40 years of intense subjectification people still care about the people around them and that's 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 an amazing thing it, it's powerful um, yeah, and like one of the central things about neoliberalism is that it assumes that individuals need to be forced into being um, individualistic and entrepreneurial and all these different um, subjectified norms. And the pandemic showed that they've not done that yet. They haven't managed to fuck us over. They haven't managed to break us up. Into yet. Give them norms. time. Oh, God. Well, they, well, they haven't managed it yet. In 40 years, they haven't managed it. Um, I, I, and I think that is something that's worth holding on to. Oh, Lots agree. of cities um, still, like like the area I live in, all these, all these isolated blocks of people who are, uh, like the whole system is trying to isolate you from. You talk to people on stairwells, you talk to people on lifts. Uh, we have communities reaching out to each other because we realise that without each other, without human contact, we're fucked. Um, and it kind of, like, even with how much the structural pressures of these blocks forces into these particular subjectivities, people still break out of them. Uh, and that's incredibly hopeful I, like 
we have big problems in the world. We're recruiting towards climate catastrophe. The like lots of ways are fucked, but meeting a neighbour on a lift who has a lovely dog and having a good conversation with him is a moment of positivity about connection that is worth embracing, I think, um, and worth building upon. We're trying to build a community sort of resistance point. Because if, any, if anything is going to save the world, it's people building resistances within the places in which they live. Uh, and I think that's kind of beautiful. I, I, I absolutely agree. I've, I've touched on this actually in several videos in the past about like, hey, I know shit sucks and not trying to take away from that because it's something we need to actively fight back against. But there were, again, some really beautiful moments during this pandemic, whether it was, you know, grannies suddenly knitting up a storm for for kids and uh, like breweries retooling to, you know, OK, we're we're going to cease beer production or spirit production for a while and we're going to retool for making hand sanitizer and distribute it around mm. the community. It's like. Th that does give me a sense of hope that if and when the entire system and like society collapses through like a climate related catastrophe or nuclear Armageddon, there's going to be some shred of humanity left over that whether it's trying to quote unquote get back to normal or just take care of the people in its immediate area, it's going to result in yes, definite hardship, but there's definitely going to be that kind of sense of caring and community because that is a story as old as humanity because yeah. and and you know i i really hate the sort of like you know oh no it's a it's a dog eat dog world it's a jungle yeah. there. you got to survive it's like listen man we literally have evidence that early hominids were like taking care of each other and you know they healed from a what would have been if they had been hyper individualistic like people want to insist on these days mm. they would have died in the savannas or the jungles of africa but their community took care of them they went out and made sure that they still had enough to eat and were taken care of and they healed so that they could then rejoin and like do work or whatever and just help continue to support the tribe and the group. And this is why we have things like elders because, Oh look, there's older people now they can't go hunting or whatever. Well, we care about them because this is our community. Like we've, we've been dealing with this for millennia since before we were even truly human. This was something we were doing for each other because we recognize it's way better to work together in like packs or tribes, or however you want to, you know, uh, quantify it. It was way better and easier for us for our survival to do that than be like, I'm a single solitary man. It's a dog eat dog world. It's like, bro, literally your ancestors realized this was a stupid idea. Why are you being it, more stupid than cavemen? <laughs> like, <laughs> it, oh yeah. I, it's like one of the most consistent, um, like modern sociological studies is how people react during crisis, whether that's something like Hurricane Katrina, whether it's like an earthquake. And the most consistent evidence is that people come together and they help each other during these crises. And the idea that we naturally are individualistic, and we naturally go out for ourselves during these, these times, is propaganda from the liberals and the neoliberals to say that this is how we should act or this like yeah. it's, it's simply not true people act like obviously some people are dicks that's the case yeah i mean some like we've seen the people dicks. you know like armed with ar-15s while they're all trying to like get gas at gas stations like yeah that that's unfortunately a thing yeah but like but there were also boatloads any, of people any bringing like, supplies to people as well, right? So, tip any for Any natural disaster, you will see people supporting each other. You, you will see people come together to try and survive. Um, and obviously what we want is not people having to do that. Um, and there are particular pressures pushing people in particular directions. The moment someone appeals to human nature to say that something like oh we're, we're all out for ourselves it's human nature they're bullshitting 
Yeah, like this. Human no, nature's. human human nature is cooperation. Sure, I, there's I, still I, conflict I mean, with other humans, but like fundamentally, there's some cooperation with other humans that you identify as part of, like your group, your tribe, whatever. Like this has all been built on some kind of cooperation between even just family units. Like this is the story of humanity here. I mean, I don't. I don't think it's necessarily true that human nature is cooperation. But I think what's true is that human nature doesn't exist. And that if we want to create a society in which something better is possible, we can create systems which push people into better directions. Um, we okay, can I say, think I see where you're coming from. Yeah, I, like, as an old phrase, like, he who invokes human nature is trying to cheat. Anyone can invoke human nature. To, to justify their argument. I, I think that we can say human nature isn't necessarily a thing. What is important is building the systems which push us to behave in ways which are best for human well-being and environmental well-being and, you know, animal well-being as well. Yeah, and of course that also kind of touches on a point that like I haven't really brought up before in the channel because it hasn't really had a place, but it's something that I've talked about in real life with other people. Um, a lot of like those aspects that you touch on and like environmentalism and such, uh, those are also environmental as well as cultural factors that can affect people and societies and systems. Mm -hmm. Like th there seems to be this, um, I forget who did it, at least off the top of my head, but I remember watching a really good video by someone a while back, like a couple years ago now, about um, this sort of weird view of like the kind of um, Western Orientalism view of like Eastern philosophy as kind of fascinating as opposed to appreciating it as, oh, an equally valid cultural standpoint yeah. of philosophy for a human civilization and society that is just uh, not western right it's part of that whole western centric um, thing i find that there is always you know this solely western centric view um, as opposed to like th there's often a kind of mysticism associated with eastern philosophies when again it's kind of like a lot of the stuff that we use in the west was either preserved by the east or was contributed or expanded upon by them like algebra even though we see it as like oh it's a core part of western education it is fundamentally arabic in origin arabic numerals are like west arabic numerals which again they imported in terms of especially the concept of zero from India, because they were doing that shit before anyone was. Mm. So it made its way westward. And, you know, Chinese philosophy, as much as I haven't studied it, I really would like to one of these days, if and when I can find the spare eternity to delve into all the classics. It mm. just really shows that, unfortunately, a lot of people these days have this kind of view of west is best west is the only way there's nothing that we've taken from other people no that hasn't happened and uh any other philosophy or view especially as it relates to a localized environment therefore invalid right like the yeah. indus valley civilization is i think one of if not the oldest civilizations that humanity had ever known and so the development of civilization and agriculture along the gangetic plain in northern india that is worth you know studying and seeing how they view that in existence through a cultural lens not saying i entirely agree with it or you know certain aspects of hinduism but there's in my opinion some validity there in terms of these are another group of humans trying to figure out their place in the cosmos the universe why things are the way they are why they behave the way they are and they've done their best over the years to uh, work within like what limited understanding they had and also adopting science and stuff as it came and developed and now they are you know reevaluating things and making their own innovations etc right like you know I, I know people love to meme on India and like oh it's still not a superpower haha -ha, Modi but um and again like it's a little weird that they have a space program when you know there's still a lot of people suffering in India, but at the same time, it's impressive I mean, that India has made a space program, right? Like it's like, let's, 
let's take a step back and appreciate some of what other humans have been able to do and accomplish separate from other groups of humans. Like the, the story of humanity is simultaneously, at least the way I tend to view it or think of it, it is a sort of large collective. Like we are all human. It is a story of humanity in our expanse from, from, you know, the savannas of Africa. But at the same time, we are also very much members of our own localized communities on this pale blue dot floating insignificantly in the cosmos, right? Like, there's so much that has happened on this planet that I think is worth learning about and studying. You don't necessarily have to like or agree with all of it, but just, like, for God's sakes, broaden your horizon, you know? So what what sort of springs to mind in discussions like this is a book called How the West Came to Rule. And I've heard of that book. So I, I'm doing someone it, recommended I'm it along your... with... Um, Guns, Germs, and Steel, which is about like how colonialism just like ravaged Africa. So it, it's very good for reading alongside how Europe underdeveloped Africa. That's another good uh, book, the, yes. The Walter Rodney one. Um, how, how the West Came to Rule is very good for challenging the Western-centric notion of how capitalism came to be. So a lot of previous Western... Uh, Accounts were like capitalism developed because of features internal to Europe. I think that's um, bullshit, but all right. I mean, it is. It's bullshit. <laughs> um, yeah, so good. Like, I'm right. Once again, this is awesome. Yeah. Folk like Ellen Merskin Woods, and they talk about uh, they talk about the primacy of uh, feudalism. Like the, the 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 classic story, feudalism um, displaced particular people, and the 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 contention between feudalists and uh, peasants, uh, creating the context for capitalism. What a book like How the West Came to Rule talks about is how even the very context which allows something like that to happen is born of an internationalist system, born of how the Mongolian Empire interacted with what would become Europe. It's mm. born of how the Ottoman Empire would interact with what would become Europe. The um, material factors of trade, uh, dispossession of um, particular internal relations of production would uh, were, were, were related to Europe and how Europe interacted what Europe would become interacted with them. And it, like the Ottoman Empire was viewed of as an other, and that became that, that meant that Europe as a thing came into existence in opposition to the Ottomans. Well, um, actually, I'm, I'm really glad you're bringing this up because um, I don't know how like aware many people might be aware of this, but um, the concept of the modern nation state is a very mm. European development and invention, uh, but, but reading Black Marxism by Cedric Robinson. Uh, I have I have not, um, but like just uh, the last little like note on like a sort of side tangent. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the modern nation state, as it like is thought of, is a European invention. But even then, mm. a more modern European invention. Before it was all about like dynasties and ruling over like a collection of different groups. Like that's why you had things like the uh, the Holy Roman Empire, the Austrian Empire. But they were really just like dynasties ro- ruling over various areas and kingdoms. Um, mm. It was the same with like the early development of Spain, as I learned when I lived there for a while. Uh, and so the idea of like the modern nation state of Spain is actually a relatively recent phenomenon. If you talk to someone in like the 1400s of, hey, so what does the word Spain mean to you? They'd look at you weird and be like, there's really no such thing. Like there's a bunch of Christian kingdoms to the north. I'm stuck here in Muslim controlled Iberia or in like one of these various taifas that is <laughs> Spanish speaking or something like that. But, like, it, it's a very different um, understanding, even in the medieval period, compared to, like, the onset of capitalism, the Industrial Revolution, and the idea of the modern 
like ethno state or nation state where it's we are all united by like our language our religion or our ethnicity right like that's the whole idea behind like scotland um england germany uh is like you know we we must unite the german people into a single german nation it's about the french in and uniting everyone into a french nation and that's why there was a lot of internal conflict expelling french protestants and people who didn't identify as french they were more like no i'm more just like a weird mountain person who's close to italy but i'm not italian either like in fact italy doesn't exist at this point yet that's Mm. a recent invention so like, you know, that's also why there's all this hyper regionalism in Europe is because that is buried millennia deep at this point. Yeah. And, and so I think a lot of people don't realize that the idea of the modern nation state, which was then again, exported wholesale onto Latin America and Africa is a European imperial, like superposition on these other people who didn't have that same history or that reason to create such things. Right. Um, and yeah, that was just a little tension I wanted to go on. Cause you just brought up something that reminded me about that. And I almost never get to talk about that. So sorry. Yes, please continue. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good, it's a good tangent. And it, it, it's really reminiscent of Cedric Robinson's argument in black Marxism, which, um, it's a contentious book. Um, a lot of, so a lot of the argument in black marxism hmm, am i gonna annoy some of my friends Uh-oh. okay i will um so black, black black marxism is a largely good book which has some bad opinions on how dialectic materialism works um but one of the major the best parts of the book are its historical insights into things okay. like good to know how uh, how the state formed, like you were talking, you were talking about, like the state formed as a process of um, European development, right? This was a European, an inherently European process. Yeah, the state, the, the nation state formation, um, and there's lots of really good historical examples of how things like the French state uh, in the like before the Treaty of Westphalia, before like the big moments of um, nation state formation. Which I guess peasant... uh, um, also uh, just like to, sorry to, to interrupt you again, but just um, another thing. Um, I forget exactly about the Treaty of Westphalia, but I know that another sort of crucial moment in the history of all this were the revolutions of 1848, which largely were unsuccessful, but were very much a mm-hmm. sign of the things to come of an emerging nationalism among various European locales. Um, so just to add that so, to like the list for what people yeah. may or may not know about who are listening to this. So, so the Treaty of Westphalia was uh, 1649, I think. I'm bad at specifics. 1600s, I think. Um, and it was it, it's largely viewed as like the moment in which the modern nation state was founded. Um, it was a moment in which these Europe again European states decided here are some firm boundaries to our territories. Um, was, here's what we're wait. Was the Treaty of Westphalia in relation to the War of Austrian Succession? I believe it was like 1649. Um, let me let me just Google yeah, it. All right. By the way, like I don't know how you're feeling about this, but I'm loving this so far. This is great. Oh, I'm having a great time. I'm just fucking. Oh, fuck's sake. Just fucking vibing. So, yeah, I'm fucking vibing. I just got a copyright <laughs> claim on a on a stream. Um. Yeah. No, I'm having a good. I'm 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 enjoying this. Um. Yeah. Treaty of Westphalia was the um thirty year war. Okay. Uh, right. One of the other long dynastic wars, which is why when people say monarchy is a more stable form of government than republicanism, I'm just like, hello, hi, yeah. <laughs> here's centuries of evidence to the contrary. <laughs> Someone died and left no heir, like various potential people who could claim to be heir, and it literally went into like, conf- like continent-wide conflict. No, your argument is invalid. Silence. <laughs> so much of the... Um... Much of Robinson's argument, in contrast with some of the Marx, previous Marxist arguments about nationalism, people like Stalin, 
who are bad at uh oh like, now you've upset the tankies all right hey uh, i will what i will say for the tankies i'm not saying anything about stalin's practices he was bad at theory <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, his stalin's book on the national question is just a bad piece of work <laughs> um this is not like this is not a very good piece of theory and I've got friends, I've got like ML friends who are like, yeah, obviously. Um, it's not a good piece of theory because Stalin was a Chad. He wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't a dark. Uh, oh, thanks. God. What even is real life? <laughs> oh, man. Um, but yeah, right. Yeah. Culture, uh, black um, Marxism. I would nearly well, did yeah, the Jordan Marxism. Peterson thing. I was saying cultural Marxism. God damn it. Uh, um, so, so lots of Cedric Robinson's argument is about the emergence of the nation state as a particular European construct. Um, and that has implications about how we fight for liberation beyond that um, construct. Um, I'm not going to necessarily dictate how other people fight for their own liberation. But for those in the global north, I think it means that we orient our um, our, our struggles in support of those who are trying to fight for anti-imperialism and their own liberation. So, for example, CLR James talked about how the need to fight for anti-imperialism within our own states is the most pressing issue for Western leftists. People in the global north wasn't a term back then, but like people in the global north needed to fight um, the, the, the structures which perpetuated global imperialism. Um, in the modern day in Britain, one good example of that is things like protest, protesting EBIT, uh, which is a, an arms manufacturer which um, exports arms to Israel. The, the connection between the nation state resistance and imperialism is a direct line through Cedric Robinson's arguments about what a nation state is, how it's exported across the world. Um, have I have I made sense there or have I just No, I I think like <laughs> the the way I understand it is um the modern nation state also then sees itself in relation to other nation states. And so it seeks to secure its own existence and its economic success. So this ties into colonialism, imperialism, various aspects like that. And in the modern day, in terms of market access and economic success, which is why we see things like the French still continuing to be involved in West Africa, um, that's kind of my general understanding of that, like in sort of very broad terms. Yeah, so I guess my point was when we talk about the nation state, it's easy to think of it as a universal concept. Here is a group of people who exist together. They form a structure that is the nation state. Or, well, even, like, but, what we have now is, like, the, the a nation within a nation, right? It's, like, they're a nation, an ethnic nation. Like, that's what Quebec is officially recognized as in Canada. They're sure. a nation. So, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, like, ex, I'm trying to, like, talk about how empty the concept of nation state really is. <laughs> the, the, the moment that you start questioning it. Uh, it's the moment that you realise how Eurocentric it is. So, like you're saying, the nation within the nation with Quebec, um, when you start talking about things like black nationalism, uh, a nationalism which is built in opposition to hegemonic white supremacism of the United States or the United Kingdom, um, then you talk about indigenous nationalism which is built in opposition to uh, the hegemonic nationalism of Australia, of Peru, of Israel, of, of all of these settler colonial states. Um, and it's the settler colonialism which is building the nationalism. 
And that settler colonialism is an inherently Western process in itself, too, even if it's been exported to other contexts. So what is, I, th I think, useful about Cedric Robinson's idea of nationalism is that it allows us to break down how those things aren't natural and how to resist them in a useful way to say that black nationalism um, is a extension of cultures which have been exported from Africa, transplanted in um, the West Indies, and then used to build resistance to the imperialism which creates them as nationalisms, and then to redefine what nationalism itself means. And that is a very useful thing in my mind. Fair enough. Um, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, I'm intrigued now. I, I really want to read this book. It is a very different thing to what Scottish nationalism is, which is a nationalism built on imperialism, um, built on whiteness, and built on a soft rejection of colonialism, which still like inherits British imperialism. And it's... I, I would say to anyone who wants to read Black Marxism, to read it, if you can, with a group, because it's a complex book. Um, and it's not perfect. Uh, but there's lots of interesting stuff to get from it. Okay. What are, um, what are some other books you would, uh, suggest for people to, to read other than like the big one, I guess, which is Das Kapital. That's can't see it was that society. Social, repro oh, social, social reproduction. reproduction. Okay. Social reproduction theory, um, which is an edited volume by, uh, edited by Tithi Bhattacharya. Um, which has been instrumental in my work. Um, okay. Social reproduction. You heard it here social first, folks. Yeah. Uh, social reproduction theory and necropolitics. Necropolitics by Akil Mbembe. Mm, yeah. Uh, I guess that means we get to talk about that for a bit. Because like, I, I still have like a bunch of questions for, for you. Like just some sort of more... Uh, personal ones and other ones I just want to pick your brain on. Um, this has been mm -hmm. great, by the way, again. Thank you so much for this. But um, Necropolitics, I'm pretty sure, was like either one of the first or the very first video of yours that I saw, like back when I was first starting doing whatever the hell all this is. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, in many ways, for those who haven't seen it, it's like, let's be real here. It's a little depressing. <laughs> um, just in terms of like the subject matter and what it's talking about and, yeah. uh, just the like callous contempt and disregard of neoliberalism and the state apparatus. Um, but it was still very like elucidating in terms of learning something new about how the state and neoliberalism views itself and what the kind of quote unquote, end goal is if you can even call it that in the wake of that like you, even like during your video you're kind of there like blowing the the like little celebration thing but it's clearly like yeah we're all life life is pain kids like so how how do you after you know talking about stuff like that what gives you hope or optimism in terms of recognizing the system of necropolitics and then dismantling that? Um, do you think it's useful for me to talk about what, what that necropolitics is first? Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. So, necropolitics is, um, uh, is based on a book by Akil Mbembe. And it is a sort of negation of uh, Foucault's idea of biopolitics. And Foucault's idea of biopolitics was that what defines politics these days is how life is managed, how, how particular subjectivities, how particular forms of life are managed. And 
uh, Foucault thought that death was relegated to a subservient fashion within that context. And Mbembe didn't agree with that. Mbembe thought that biopolitics had lots of positive dimensions, but that death played a central role in how politics was managed, where that is how people are um, forced into immigrant detention centres, where that is how, um, say, someone who's on welfare is, is kept in a state close to death in, in the global north. Um, death is the sort of motivating factor that keeps people living in the biopolitical, in the, in the biopolitical sense. Mm -hmm. And obviously that is not a particularly cheery subject. Yeah, no, like um, I said, like the video is kind of depressing, but I think it's important. Hope in that context. I mean, what I would go back to would be things from the pandemic again. Okay. So the pandemic was a huge necropolitical event. Um, I don't, I, I, I don't have as much uh, expertise in what happened in Canada. Um, in the UK, a lot of what happened was people were there, there was a lot of necropolitics in the sense that those who had disabilities, those who were vulnerable were considered expendable. Mm. Those who could uh, go on to produce value were considered um, useful. So that was highlighted here too with um, disability and like the payments that they got and the CERB, which was like the brief program of $2,000 a month and people in ODSP didn't qualify and they got even less and it's like mm. they're supposed to survive on that. It's forced poverty, but like that's something I've talked about at length at this point. So what brings you hope in these situations is how those who were considered um, useful helped those who were considered useless. Um, okay. the, the, the modes that were opened up of supporting each other. And my, my particular theory is that necropolitics is an absence of the ability to produce each other social reproductively, which um, social reproductiveness is essentially the ability to reproduce yourself and reproduce your labor power as a commodity. In the first instance, that means being able to live. And in the second instance, it means being able to live and have a job, essentially. Right. Um, so a lot of what gives me hope was people who were willing to say, I, I am willing to forgo my labor power, my, my ability to reproduce myself in the second instance, in order to support people to just live in the first. To support people's lives rather than their labor power. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it ties back to something we were talking about earlier about community and uh, people helping each other and coming together in a time of crisis yeah. and challenge. It, but it's more than that. It's like people can come together. There's... You can come together and you can support each other to carry on with your job, right? And if you can carry on with your job, then you're still producing something for, you know, the capitalist, whatever. Yay, my favorite but thing to do every day. If you're saying, I want to support you, and I have no care about whether or not you are continuing with your job, you're just supporting the person. And there's a difference between those things. Yeah, because like one is a conditional support, the other is unconditional. Yeah. And a lot of what I saw during the pandemic was people saying, I don't care whether you can do your job or not. I want you to live. You're my neighbor. You're my friend. Let's survive. Let's break down these, these ideals. Um, not consciously, but like, People are just saying, I don't, I don't fucking give a shit about whether or not you can contribute to the economy. I just want you to live. 
Yeah, that ties back to like what I was ranting about, about, you know, we took care of people who broke their legs and arms and such mm. from the earliest days of, you know, before we were even fully human, because that's just kind of what we did. It was kind of taking care of the collective. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, I, I'm, I'm glad we got to touch a bit on necropolitics and offering at least... Um, a bit of hope, but um, like there's, if there's any single question that I always want to try and ask people is the following question, which is what radicalized you? Because based on all of this, like you've done a whole ton of reading, you've been in school for a long time, you know, teaching other young kids, sorry, no, you're, you're radicalizing poor, innocent people at school, uh, probably as part of the deep state. Like what? What was your moment of either like your youth, your adult life? That was your moment of radicalization. I never had a moment of radicalization. Really? There wasn't so, anything that made you think like systems fucked. I want to rail against it. So when I was growing up, my um, my my dad, my mom and my dad were both fairly left wing um okay my sort of radicalization has been a slow process of just reading more learning more. like i i grew up in a in an area a very mixed area where i had people who had much more privileged upbringings like i did uh and those who didn't um and with growing up in that context, you're like, this is obviously unfair. Why should I have a better up- upbringing than, than someone else? But the, I also was lucky enough to have, a, like, my my favorite story about my dad, my mom told me recently, was that he, uh, <laughs> he was the uh, only revolutionary communist who would plant a car bomb uh, but we'd worry about double parking. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> also terrifying. I don't know if I can put that on like YouTube and hope to have this monetized, but that's a hilarious story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like that, 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 that's who he was. Um, he, he was very concerned about double parking, and he also wanted to break the machine. Uh, <laughs> Oh, that is so, so, not gonna lie. That's peak dad energy. <laughs> yeah. So there's never been like one moment of radicalization. Things that have pushed me further, like when you work for welfare rights and you see how fucked the system is, you realize things have to change. When you have people on the phone to you multiple times a day saying that they're going to kill themselves because they can't get welfare that's a sobering moment for you um, but those things aren't necessarily radicalizing because I've always been quite a radical person okay. um, because of just the benefit of having a good family who were themselves communists to, <laughs> to an extent yeah, so I, I guess that means it's it's in the family now. You're just like a proud communist. Yeah. There you go, everybody. It, he's he's openly stating he's a communist. It's my it's like the greatest fear of a communist is producing a fucking melt child. <laughs> Pete Buttigieg, fucking Kamala Harris, Ed Miliband. All these people, they had communist parents who were fucking rad as hell and they produced melt fucking children. Uh, no, I mean, I, uh, a, a part of me has been tempted to sometimes share, like when I get together for dinners with, uh, my mom and, or my dad, uh, and just share like, Oh gee, I wonder where I get this stuff from and just share like some of what they're sharing on Facebook or some of the rants that they say at the dinner table. It's like, huh? Yeah. Okay. No, I'm definitely their kid. Like <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the rants that come from those two, my God puts me to shame sometimes. I mean, um, what 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 gets me about my dad? Um, he's so good on trans rights and um, 
sex workers' rights. Like, he's so on it. For a boomer, that's impressive. He, he's, all, like, this January, he'll be 70. Wow. And he's so on it. Hey, cheers to your father's health. Cheers to um, Colin Duncan. Cheers to Colin Duncan. Hi, Bother Brigade. Thanks for watching yet another episode of Progressive Profiles. Speaking of, thank you again so much to John the Duncan for coming on and just spreading and sharing so much knowledge and opinions about anything ranging from Scottish nationalism to necropolitics to the current neoliberal structure, but also how we can fight back and offering some good hope for the future, right? So once again, if you enjoy his stuff, you will find a link to his channel and all his other socials in the description down below. And if you also like what I do here, or what I'm trying to do here anyway, then yeah, hi, I'm the Bothered Boy, and uh, I make videos more or less every day. And um, yeah, if you like seeing daily rants about a host of various different topics and subjects, please consider liking and subscribing. And on top of that, there is a Patreon that we have that uh, allows you to support not only this show, but also me as a creator, especially since sometimes uh, the takes and the subject matter get a little too spicy for YouTube and its algorithm. So if you feel like supporting me on Patreon, thank you very much for doing so, which means also I really want to shout out my patrons that I already have. All this is possible thanks to you and your continued support, which I am immensely grateful for. But I'm also grateful to every single one of you who watched this video, and especially right here to the end. The support of everyone that I get on this channel and for this project is just almost overwhelming, and I can't put into words how much I well and truly appreciate it. It it really helps provide a bit of a light in the dark times, and it shows again as we talked about with John, you know, just earlier in the video, it's about community and keeping people close together and being there for each other. That's how we get out of, you know, the pandemic and out of any other crisis that the world throws our way. And we have evidence for this, but unfortunately, we still continue to live and participate in a capitalist hellscape every day, and that's what's bothering me today.